Hello everyone. Today we are going to learn set theory. It is sometimes said that mathematics is the study of sets and functions. Naturally, this oversimplifies matters. But it does come as close to the truth as an aphorism can. The study of sets and functions leads two ways. One path goes down into the edge of logic, philosophy and the foundations of mathematics. The other goes up onto the highlands of mathematics itself, where these concepts are indispensable in almost all of pure mathematics as it is today. Needless to say, we follow the latter course. We regard sets and functions as tools of thought and our purpose in this discussion is to develop these tools to the point where they are sufficiently powerful to serve our needs throughout the list of our discussion. As the reader or as we proceed, we will understand that the words set and functions are not as simple as they may seem. In a sense, they are simple, but they are potent words. And the quality of simplicity they possess is that which lies on the far side of complexity. They are like seeds, which are primitive in appearance, but have capacity for vast and intricate development. So we start our first topic, set and set inclusion. We adopt a new point of view in our discussion of sets and we assume that the concepts of an element and of a set of elements are intuitively clear. By an element, we mean an object or entity of some sort. As for example, a positive integer, a point on the real line, that is a real number, or a point in the complex plane, that is a complex number. And a set, a set is a collection or aggregate of such elements considered together or as a whole. So I repeat again. A set is a collection or aggregate of such elements considered together or as a whole. Some examples are furnished by the set of all even positive integers, the set of all rational points on the real line and the set of all points in the complex plane whose distance from origin is 1, that is a unit circle on the plane. We reserve the word class to refer to a set of sets, a set of sets. We might speak, for instance, of the class of all circles in a plane, thinking of each circle as a set of points. It will be useful in this discussion we do if we carry this hierarchy one step further and use the term family or the set of classes. One more remark the word element, set, class, and family are not intended to be rigidly fixed in their uses. We use them freely to express varying attitudes towards the mathematical objects and systems we study. It is entirely reasonable, for instance, to think of a circle not as a set of points but as a single entity in itself, in which case we might justifiably speak of the set of all circles in a plane. There are two standards, standard notations available for 
designating a particular set. Whenever it is feasible to do so, we can list its elements between braces. Thus, 1, 2, 3 within the second brace signifies the set consisting of an of the first three positive integer. Again, 1, i, minus 1, minus i within second base is the set of all or is a set of four fourth root of unity and again uh, plus minus one plus minus three plus minus five etc within second base is the set of all odd integers this manner of specifying a set by listing its elements is unworkable in many circumstances we are then obliged to fall back on the second method. So what is the second method? Uh, it is to use a property or attribute that characterize the elements of the set in question. So if P denotes a certain property of element, so by P we denote a certain property of element then within first bracket, second bracket x such that p uh, stands for the set of all elements x for which the property p is meaningful and true for example consider the expression uh, within second base x such that x is real and irrational which we read the set of all x such that x is real and irrational. This denotes the set of all real numbers which cannot be written as a quotient of two integers. The set under discussion contains all those elements and other obviously which possess the stated property. That's three sets of numbers where we are given the examples uh, described there in the slides uh, can be written either way. 1, 2, 3 in the second base, this can be written as n such that n is an integer and 0 less than n less than 4. Again, the set we have taken earlier 1 i minus 1 minus i within the second brace this can be further written as z such that z is a complex number and z to the power 4 equals to 1 and another set which we have also given example uh, earlier the set containing plus minus 1 plus minus 3 plus minus 5 and so on this can be written as n such that n is an odd integer. We often sort in our notation. So how how do we sort uh, we uh, sort our we can sort our notations? This we will describe in the next slide. So we often sort in our notations, uh, for instance, the last two sets, the last two sets mentioned uh, in the last part of my slide, uh, the previous slide, uh, they can be perfectly will be written like z such that z to the power 4 equals to 1 and the last one can be written as in such that n is odd. Our purpose is to be clear and to avoid misunderstanding and if this can be achieved with less notation, so much the better. In the same vein, we can write uh, 
the unit circle has z such that mod z equals to 1 or the closed unit disk closed unit disk in this way z such that mod z less equals to 1 or the open disk open unit disk this can be written as z such that mod z less 1 this is strictly less 1 we use a special system of notation for designating intervals of various kinds on the real line if a and b are real numbers such that a less than equals to or a is strictly less than b then the following symbols uh, on the left are defined to be the indicated sets on the right that is in the left hand the first example we take the first example in the left hand there is a comma b within third brace this is actually equals to the collection of x such that a less than equals to x less than equals to b okay the next one a comma b within first and third brace this is actually x the collection of, our, of all element x such that a less than x less than equals to b or the third one a comma b within third and first brace this is equals to the set of all x such that a less equals to x less equals to b similarly the fourth one okay we speak of this as the closed the open closed the closed open and the open interval from a to b the first one is closed second one open closed third one closed open and the last one is open open interval from a to b in particular the closed interval 0 comma 1 uh, which you can write within the third bracket uh, is a closed unit interval and another 0 comma 1 within the first brace is the open unit interval okay. now there are certain logical difficulties which arise in the foundation of theory of sets we avoid these difficulties by assuming that each discussion in which a number of sets are involved takes place in the context of a single fixed set uh, the problem we have mentioned will come later we will discuss it later we will rather it will discuss a little elaborately so before that uh, we have to introduce some symbols or some notations okay the first one is universal set which you often write by u capital u uh, the set is called universal set it is denoted by capital u uh, in this section or in this part uh, and the next all part every set mentioned is assumed to consist of elements in capital u in later slides there will always be on hand a given space within which we work and this will serve without further comment as a universal set this is often convenient to have available in capital u a set containing no elements whatever we call this the empty set and denote it by the symbol phi so phi is empty set or you can say as null set okay a set is said to be finite if it is empty or consists of n elements for some positive integer n 
otherwise it is said to be infinite okay so so you have introduced universal set null set finite set and infinite set now we usually denote elements by small letters elements of set by small letters and sets by large letters so if small x is an element and capital a is a set the statement that x is an element of a or belongs to a or you can say is contained in a is symbolized by x belongs to a okay we denote the negation of this namely the statement that x is not an element of a by x does not belongs to a okay now we come to the equality of sets two sets a and b are said to be equal if they consist of exactly same elements we denote this relation by a equals to b so whenever we write a equals to b that means a and b sets are equal and they consist of exactly the same elements and the negation negation of this is written a not equals to b okay we say a capital a is a subset of b or is contained in b if each element of a is also an element of b okay this relation is symbolized by a is a subset of b we sometimes express this by saying that b is a superset of a or we can say contains a so a is a subset of b allows for the possibility that a and b might be equal if a is a subset of b and is not equal to b we say that a is a proper subset of b or is properly contained in b okay this relation is denoted by a is a proper subset of b we can also express this proper relation by saying that b is a proper subset of a or properly contains a this relation uh, subset is usually called set inclusion okay we sometimes reverse the symbols introduced in this slide okay so how can we reverse these uh, symbols that that is a is a subset of b or a is a proper subset of b are occasionally written in the equivalent form b is a superset of a and b is a proper superset of a it will often be convenient to have a symbol for logical implication and imply is the symbol to use so suppose we have two statements p and q then p implies q p implies q this means that p 
if p is true then q is also true similarly the both both way implication this symbol is the two way implication symbol or logical equivalent symbol it means that the statement on each side implies the statement on the other and is usually read if and only if or is equivalent to okay the main properties of set inclusion are obvious they are the following first one a is a subset of a for every a second one a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a this should this two together should imply a equals to b and the third one a is a subset of b and b is a subset of c these two together should imply a is a subset of c okay now it is quite important to observe that the condition 1 and condition 2 these two condition can be combined into single statement what is the statement the statement is a equals to b implies and implied by a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a so if a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a these two together condition together imply a equals to b and the other way is also true that is if a equals to b we have to think a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a this remark contains a useful principle of proof namely that the only way to show that two sets are equal apart from merely inspecting them is to show that each is a subset of the other this condition this condition we will use mainly in problems uh they are very useful from from the point of view of uh, solving uh, mathematical problems on set theory they are very important
so as we have mentioned that there are some logical difficulties which can arise in the foundation of the set theory that we have uh, learned okay so what is the difficulty what is or what difficulties can arise so to describe this thing uh, we introduce Russell's paradox with respect to our known notion of set theory. This Russell's paradox come from the construction of the set which we have discussed in the earlier slides. So what is that paradox? Or what we can learn from this? We are going to discuss that. So basically in the foundation of mathematics Russell's paradox it was discovered by Bertrand Russell Russell in 1901 so he showed that some attempted formalizations of knife set theory created by George Cantor the set theory we have learned now just now or the, some parts we have learned just now this thing can lead to a contradiction or this thing can lead to a contradiction okay the same paradox actually the same paradox had been discovered in 1899 by Hans Germello but he did not publish the idea which remain unknown or which remain known only to David Hilbert Edmund Husserl and other members of the University of Göttingen. At the end of 1890s, Cantor himself had already realized that his definition would lead to a contradiction, which he told Hilbert and Richard Dedekind by letter. Okay, so what is the paradox? To explain what is this, we begin by observing that a set can easily have elements which are themselves sets. For example, the set we have written 1, 2, 3 within brace and 4. This raises the possibility that is set this raises the possibility that a set might will contain itself as one of its elements okay we call such a set an abnormal set so what is abnormal set a set which contains itself as one of its element okay and any set which does not contain itself as an element we call a normal set so we again repeat a set can have member which is itself a set so this type of generalization lead us to think of abnormal set a set which contains itself as one of its element a normal set exactly the reverse thing which does not con contain itself as one of its member so most sets are normal and if we suspect that abnormal sets are in some way undesirable we might try to confine our attention to the set in of all normal sets so now we have a collection of sets collection of normal set that we define or we call 
by n. So n capital N is the set of all normal set. Okay. So the main question now the main question is is a sure question is that if n is normal or abnormal. It should be the either way. That means it is evidently that one or the other. It cannot be both. Okay. So now we can prove that it's a very surprising fact that if you can if you can show that if n is normal, we can prove n is abnormal. And on the other hand, if you assume that n is abnormal, we can prove n is normal. How? Let us consider the first case. So our question is, n is normal or abnormal? At first, we assume n is normal. So n is a normal set. But what is n? n is the set of all normal set okay so n should contain itself because n is a normal set and this imply is n in n is abnormal because it contains itself so we have assumed that n is normal and we come to the conclusion n is abnormal. So the proof is very simple. And on the other way, on the other way we can, we can show, let us suppose n is abnormal. So what is the definition of abnormal set? By abnormal set, we mean a set which contains itself as one of its elements. Hence, in contains itself because we have assumed n is a abnormal set. So, in contains itself. Now, since n is the collection of all normal sets, so n must be normal because in belongs to n, so n should be normal. Hence, we have proved that. If we assume n is an abnormal set, then it should be normal. So the conclusion is self-contradictory. Okay. Uh, and it seems uh, to be the assumption that n exists as a set which has brought us to this impasse. Okay. So, this is the basically the Russell's paradox. Uh, it shows that the formal set theory, the formal set theory, there is a abnormality. Okay. Or we come to a contradiction or a self-contradiction. So, this is a particular counter example of knife set theory. Okay. So, uh, it was discovered in 1901. So, how we can avoid or is there any way to avoid such kind of uh, contradictory thing in set theory? The answer is yes. There is a way or there are ways to overcome this type of contradiction the number, one of them is ZFC set theory or Zermelo Frankel set theory there are other set theory other kinds of set theory which uh, don't have this type of paradox and uh, more general or more rigid 
then this needs it here. Okay. The germanofrancal axioms for set theory uh, were developed in response to this uh, contradiction which arises in our naive set theory. The key axiom which obviates Russell's paradox is the axiom of specification which roughly allows new sets to be built based on a predicate or condition but only quantified over some set. So we will not go into details but uh, this is the Melo Frankel axioms. Uh, this allows or this helps us to overcome this type of process paradox. There are other ways of escaping this process paradox. Uh, one is more scale set theory. There is another kind of theory. Okay, we will not go into this. So, now on, we will just motivate our talk in this naive set theory and we will introduce some basic operations on set itself. So we begin our discussion uh, on algebra of sets. So we consider several useful ways in which sets can be combined with one another and we develop the chief properties of these operations of combination. As we emphasize all the sets we mention here are assumed to be subsets of our universal set capital U. U is the or capital U is the frame of reference or the universe for our present discussions. Later, the frame of reference in a particular context will naturally depend on what ideas we happen to be considering. Okay. If we find ourselves studying uh, sets of real numbers, then capital U is a set R, capital R, of all real numbers. If we wish to study sets of complex numbers, then we take capital U to be the sets capital C of all complex numbers. We sometimes want to narrow the frame of reference um, and to consider um, only subsets of the closed unit interval 0, 1 or of the closed unit disk. Closed unit disk means the all elements Z such that modulus of z less than equals to 1 we say and in these cases we choose capital U accordingly okay. generally speaking the universal set capital U is at our disposal and we are free to select it to fit the needs of the moment for the present however capital U to be regarded as a fixed but arbitrary set. This generality allows us to apply the ideas we developed below or in the slides um, to any situation which arises in our work. It is extremely helpful to the imagination to have a geometric picture available in terms of which you can visualize sets and operations on sets. It is extremely helpful. A convenient way to accomplish this is to represent capital U by a rectangular area in a plane. And the elements which make up capital U by the point of this area. Sets can then be pictured by areas 
within this rectangle and diagrams can be drawn which illustrates operation on sets and relations between them for instance for instance if a and b are sets then in the figure 1 if we see the figure 1 uh, if a and b are sets they represent the circumstance that a is a subset of b uh, we think um, of each set as consisting of all points within the corresponding closed curve okay so diagrammatic thought of this kind is admittedly loose and imprecise nevertheless the, we can we can find it very invaluable no mathematics however abstract may appear is ever carried on without the help of mental images of some kind and these are often nebulous, personal and difficult to describe. The first operation we discuss in the algebra of sets is that of forming unions. Okay. So we first discuss the operation union. This is a binary operation between sets. The union of two sets A and B, which we write A union B, is defined to the set of all elements which are in either A or B. Obviously, this includes all those elements which are in both. So, A union B is formed by lumping together the elements of A and those of B and regarding them as constituting a single set. Okay. In the figure 2, if we observe figure 2, A union B is indicated by the shaded area. This definition can also be expressed symbolically. How? A union B, as we have written, you can see in the slide, A union B is X such that X belongs to A or X belongs to B. Okay. Now, we can at once come, some, we can at once say some properties of this union operation. Okay. The operation of forming unions is commutative and associative okay so what do we mean by commutative that means a union b is equal to b union a and what do you, what do you mean by associative that is a union b union c is equal to a union b union c also it does have the following additional properties the properties are e union a is equals to a e union phi you can remember phi phi is null set so a union phi is a and a union capital u that is universal set is again capital u okay. we also note that if a is a subset of b this implies a union b is equals to b and also the reverse thing holds that means if a union b is equals to b then a should be a subset of b so set inclusion can be expressed in terms of this operation so we have discussed the union operation between two sets in the next slide we are going to discuss Obvious, the obvious a intersection operation so what is the intersection operation the intersection this is again a binary operation that means 
we require two sets to define this operation and this is written as a intersection this is like the reverse u but it's not exactly u uh, a intersection b is a set of all elements which are in both a and b so if we write it in symbols a intersection b is equals to x that is the set containing x where x belongs to a and x belongs to b a intersection b is the common part of the sets a and b uh, we can return c from the figure what do we mean by a intersection b it is exactly the set of tzn okay so if a intersection b is non empty we express this by saying that a intersects b if on the other hand you can see that uh, it will may happen that a and b have no common part or equivalently a intersection b is equals to phi or null set then then we say that a does not intersect b or that a and b are disjoint so these two things are equivalent a does not intersect b a and b are disjoint and a class of sets in which all pairs of distinct sets are disjoint is called a disjoint class of states or sets the operation of forming intersections is also commutative and associative that is a intersection b is equal to b intersection a and again a intersection b intersection c is equal to a intersection b intersection c so it has again the further properties um, a intersection a is equal to a a intersection phi that is null set is again a null set and a intersection u that is universal set is equal to a itself now if a is subset of b this implies a intersection b is equal to a and the other way also holds that means if a intersection b is equal to a then a is a subset of b so we see that set inclusion can also be expressed in terms of forming intersections okay so we have now defined two of the fundamental operations on sets and we have seen how each is related to set inclusion so our next obvious step is to see how they are related to one another the facts here are given by the distributive law so what is the distributive law there are two distributive laws actually the first one says a intersection b union c is equals to a intersection b union a intersection c and another one a union b intersection c is equals to a union b intersection a union c this properties depends only on simple logic applied to the meanings of the symbol involved for instance the first of the two distributive laws says that an element is in a and is in b or c precisely when it is in a and b or is in a and c we are again uh, describe it describing it this uh, phenomena that is uh, for instance uh, the first of the two distributed law okay 
that is uh, it says that an element is in A and is in B or C precisely when it is in A and B or is in A and C. We can convince ourselves intuitively of the validity of this loss by drawing picture. Okay. So we, we can see figure 4 or we can at once derive this distributed law from this figure. Okay. The second distributed law okay, um, which we have illustrated or drawn in the figure uh, where A union B intersection C is formed uh, by shading and A union B intersection A union C uh, on the right by cross shading. Okay. A moment's consideration of these diagrams ought to convince the convince our we can convince ourselves that uh, one obtains the same set in each case. So we have drawn the picture corresponding to the second one, second distributive law that is the figure 4 and uh, we can convince ourselves from this picture, this distributive law. The last of our major operations in sets is the formation of complement. Complement is unary operation. That means we require only a single set to implement this operation. The complement of a set A is denoted by A dash. It is a set of all elements which are not in A. Okay. Since the only elements we consider are those which make up capital U, it goes without saying, but it ought to be said that A dash consists of all those elements in capital U which are not in capital A. Symbolically, we write A dash is equals to X such that X does not belong to A. Okay, so complement is a unary operation and it is defined like this so in figure 5 or in the in this figure uh, we have illustrated the, this complement operation and obviously the complement of the set a is a dash and it is denoted by this set a okay this complement operation for the uh, complement operation has the, some properties like as before this union or intersection it also satisfies some properties uh, few of them are if you take complement of complement this is equals to the original set a okay if you take complement of phi that is capital u or universal set or if we take the complement of universal set that is a null set if we take union of a set and its complement set this becomes the universal set and if we take intersection between the set and its complement it becomes obviously null set further it is related to set inclusion by A is a subset of B implies B complement is a subset of A complement or reversely if B complement is a subset of A complement A is a subset of B and the formation of unions and intersections um, they are related by De Morgan's law they are very important laws uh, this law say, states that if A if you take complement of union two sets, 
it becomes there or it becomes the intersection of the complement set that is a union b whole complement is equal to a complement intersection b complement and similarly if we take the complement of intersection of two sets then it becomes the union of complement of individual sets that means if that is a intersection b whole complement is equal to a complement union b complement So you, you can describe this thing. The first equation or the first the first one of the Demandas law says that an element is not in either of two sets precisely when it is outside of both. So I'm repeating an element is not in either of two sets precisely when it is outside of both. And the second says that it is not in both precisely when it is outside of one or the other okay the second one says it is not in both precisely when it is outside of one or the other okay The operations of forming unions and intersections are primarily binary operations as we have already discussed. That is, each is a process which applies to a pair of sets and yields a third. We have emphasized this by our use of parentheses to indicate the order in which the operations are to be performed as in a1 union a2 within the first parenthesis and then in union a3 where the parenthesis direct us first to unite a1 and a2 then to unite the result of this with a3 and now associativity makes it possible to dispense with parentheses in an expression like this and to write a1 union a2 union a3 in this way there is no parentheses so how we can write this this we can write or this we can write by virtue or by power of the associativity law here we understand that these sets are to be united in any order and that the order in which the operations are performed is irrelevant. Similar remarks apply to A1 intersection A2 intersection A3. Okay. Further, if A1, A2 up to AN is any finite class of sets, then we can form a1 union a2 dot 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 union up to a n or the intersection thing in much the same way without any ambiguity of meaning whatever in order to shorten the notation we can take i capital i is equals to 1 2 up to n this is the set of subscripts which index the sets under consideration capital i is called the index set now we can compress the symbols for the union and intersection just mentioned to union over all i belongs to capital i ai or intersection over all i belongs to capital i ai as long as it is quite clear what the index set is we can write this union and intersection even more briefly in the form union over all i ai or intersection over all i ai okay 
for the sake of both brevity and clarity. These sets are often written as union i equals to 1 to n a i or intersection i equals to 1 to n a i. Okay. These extensions of our ideas and notations don't reach nearly far enough. It is often necessary to form unions and intersections of large classes of sets. So let AI be an entirely arbitrary class of sets indexed by a set capital I of subscripts. Then union over all small i belongs to capital I of a i that is equals to of all x such that x belongs to a i for at least one i belongs to capital I or the intersection thing i belongs to capital I intersection of over all this i a i that is the set of consisting all x such that x belongs to ai for every small i belongs to capital i in this way we define the union and intersection now we usually abbreviate these notations to union i ai and intersection i ai and if the class AI consists of a sequence of sets that is if this class AI is equals to A1, A2, A3, dot 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 to sub infinity then the union and intersection are often written in the form union over I equals to 1 to infinity AI or intersection I equals to 1 to infinity AI we did not require the class AI to be non empty. If it does happen that this class is empty, then the definition gives union over all I AI equals to null set and intersection over all I AI is universal set uh, this come maybe come as a surprise the last part the intersection thing the second of these thing facts act, amount to the following statement if we require if we require of an element that it belongs to each set in a given class and if there are no sets present in the class then every element satisfies this requirement okay we again repeat if we require of an element that it belongs to each set in a given class and if there are no set present in the class then every element satisfies the requirement this thing is called we call vacuously true okay if we had not made the arrangement the only element under consideration are those in capital u we would not have been able to assign a meaning to the intersection of the empty class of sets If we consider a moment and it may we can make it clear equation one that that equation is a valid for arbitrary union and intersection that is union over i ai complement of this the whole thing is equals to 
intersection over i a i complements and the other way intersection of a i over all i complement of this thing is equals to union of union over all i a i complement it is instructive or you can you can verify these equations for the case in which the class ai is empty we conclude our treatment of the general theory of sets uh, with a brief discussion of certain special classes of sets which are of considerable importance in topology logic and measure theory we usually denote classes of sets by capital letters in bold fonts okay first some general remarks which will be useful both now and later especially in connection with topological spaces we shall uh, we shall often have occasion to speak of finite unions and finite intersection by which we mean unions and intersections of finite classes of sets and by a sets for some positive integer in so we conclude our treatment of the general theory of sets with a brief discussion of certain special classes of sets which are of considerable considerable importance in topology logic and many branches of mathematics we usually denote classes of sets by capital letters in bold face uh, we can first make some general remarks which will be useful now and later especially in connection with topological spaces or many one branches of mathematics okay we shall often we shall have occasion to speak or speak of finite unions and finite intersections by which we mean union and intersection of finite class of state sets and by a finite class of sets we always mean one which is empty or consists of in sets for some positive integer in if we say that a class a class capital a of sets is closed under the formation of finite unions we mean that a contains the union of each of its finite subclasses and since the empty subclass quantifies as a finite subclass of a we see that its union the empty set is necessarily an element of capital a in the same way a class of sets which is closed under formation of infinite intersections necessarily contains the universal set now for the special classes of sets mentioned above for the remainder of this part we specifically assume that the universal set capital u is non empty now boolean algebra boolean algebra of sets is a non empty class a of subsets u which has the following properties 1 2 and 3 a and b belongs to capital a or script a uh, implies a union b belongs to belongs to script a a and b belongs to capital a or script a we, we can take it anything it implies a intersection b belongs to capital a or script a here we have taken script a to mention the boolean algebra thing or third third property a belongs to script a implies 
ए कॉम्प्लीमेंट बिलोंग्स टू स्क्रिप्ट ए Now, since script A is assumed to be non-empty, it must contain at least one of one set A. Property three, it shows A complement is in script A along with A, and since A intersection A complement is equals to five, and A union A complement is equals to capital U. So one and two, they together guarantee that script A contains the empty set and the universal set. Since the class consisting only of the empty set and the universal set is clearly a Boolean algebra of sets, these two distinct sets are the only one which every Boolean algebra of sets must contain. Okay, it is equally clear that the class of all subsets of capital.